session and I want to um, I want to introduce our, our presenter today who is Dr Julie Voss from uh, the um, Department of Digital Education, Learning Enhancement and Development in the University of London and she is going to be talking about how you structure your TEL support. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Julie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. Uh, I will just get my slides shared. OK, hopefully you can see them and hopefully everyone can hear me OK. I have got a second window with the uh, chat. So if I look down, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll remember to look up all the time. Uh, so welcome to uh, January 2020. For those of you who saw the uh, advert on, on Twitter, uh, we've traveled back in time today. We're pre-pandemic. Uh, hope you're all doing all right. Um, but actually, I think we, we'll, we'll switch forward. So uh, you may not have known, uh, I am actually a time traveler. So this is me and I will now fast forward us to January 25th, uh, 2020. So I'm Julie Vos. Um, I'm head of digital education at City University of London. I'm also a senior lecturer in educational development. Um, I've mentioned in the chat, if you are tweeting today, uh, if you could use the hash tell models and hash alt C uh, hashtags. And if you want to follow me, I'm at Julie Vos. Um, so I'm a former student of the Lancaster University PhD programme in e-research and technology enhanced learning. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about my research into organisational support structures for TEL in, in UK higher education. Um, please do introduce yourselves in, in the chat. Um, uh, it'd be great to see uh, who's here today. Um, so I'm going to be using Poll Everywhere as well. I have shared a link for that in the chat. Um, hopefully you, you've seen that one. OK, so what I'm going to do is just give you a brief overview of my research and then I'm going to focus on three areas of the research. So uh, we're looking at TEL support structures, uh, location of the TEL team within the institution and then TEL governance. Uh, it's going to be fairly interactive. I'm going to give you some tasks to do and we will be using Padlet. Uh, there'll be some quiet time um, where you'll be able to work on the tasks and then we'll, we'll be discussing it, uh, what you put into the Padlet. So the aim of the research was to investigate um, TEL support models within UK higher education institutions and it focused on these three key areas. So one is the types of TEL support model and how those TEL support models have evolved over time. Uh, then it was looking at how a particular model will help or hinder the successful adoption of TEL within the institution and then looking at whether uh, TEL adoption was influenced by organisational culture. So the research took uh, a three stage exploratory design approach and the results from the first stage informed the design of the second stage. And stage one was uh, an online survey that was sent to the heads of e-learning forum. Uh, 33 institutions responded to that. And then interviews were carried out with five heads of e-learning, which probed further into the themes that emerged during the survey stage. Now the research took place between sort of uh, 2015, 2016. So it's, it's going back quite a bit, but it'd be useful today for me to see how things might have changed since then, especially as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so following the data analysis, there were several key findings that emerged and I presented these at one of the old winter conferences as part of a tweet chat and that focused on similar topics to the ones we're looking at today. And then I also did a directed content analysis of the USIZA Technology Enhanced Learning case study. So these accompany the USIZA TEL survey, which runs every two years. And, and I used these themes to identify similarities and differences between my findings and the case studies. So in terms of the key findings, so support for TEL within UK HEIs has typically evolved organically, uh, primarily by increasing the number of staff supporting TEL. Um, but there were concerns that existing teams were being overloaded as more technologies were taken on. So typically teams started off as a, a VLE team, and then as things like lecture capture, uh, plagiarism detection tools came along, they were expected to take on those tools, but maybe with limited additional resource. Um, 
what we started to see was institutions were then taking a bit more of a rational and strategic approach. So thinking about the technologies that are supporting and, and how they can best support that. Um, and a lot of that came as part of a, a wider review or to have a particular focus on tell. Uh, larger teams um, started to evolve. Uh, I'm talking about maybe teams with 15 or more staff, um, and they started to specialize in particular areas. So this mean, meant you might have a team who focused more on the support side of, of TEL, you might have others that focus more on some of the project side. But some of the challenges around the, so focusing in these specialist areas mean there's, there's less variety for staff. And I think one of the, the people fed back that sometimes their support staff just felt like sort of ticket monkeys just constantly responding to support. But not having that opportunity to, to look at other areas and explore projects. Um, local support is something that has either come about because either the what we would call the sort of the, the central or the primary technology enhanced learning team were at capacity or um, in terms of like the support they could provide or it was a result of increased demand for specific support so it could be for a particular initiative like putting a, a fully online uh, program. Um, so Local support is an interesting one, um, and it's looking at how the central teams might work with, with local support. Um, and this has parallels with this model from Nichols and Anderson, which is this core and custom model. So you would have the, the core activities, so supporting uh, technologies for the whole institution would be done more centrally, but where you have more bespoke or, or custom activities, um, such as developing a particular uh, master's program, uh, specialist learning design skills, they might be done more at a local level. Um, the issue arises, though, where there's this overlap between the central and the local teams. And, and what I looked at was how you try and overcome that through things like good working relationships, through good uh, governance of TEL. So most institutions in the survey identified themselves as what we termed sort of centralised, um, which means that there's like a single central unit combining a number of different support functions for TEL. Uh, but when I explored this in the interviews, those institutions who felt they were centralized typically had what was called a primary tell team who but they worked in partnership with other departments so they might work with IT or they might work with educational development and there might also be some form of local tell support that wasn't coordinated by the center uh, which could be the teams or, or individual members of staff so they weren't actually just one central unit they were a mixture of units all working together um, there were some evolved, uh, div sorry, devolved structures um, where, when I did the research, and I don't know if they, they still exist. So Manchester um, University had a very devolved structure where it was all based in the faculties. Um, and where I used to work at Imperial, we had very strong faculty teams, uh, and I worked in a central e-learning team within IT. So mainly devolved, but we had good connections between the centre and, and, the, and the faculties. Um, and since uh, I did the research, we've also seen the rise of separate distance learning units with very large numbers of staff which support the development of fully online programs. So King's Online, uh, the, the team at Coventry are, are good examples of that. And the USISA TEL survey, uh, the 2020 data showed that 21% of institutions had a separate distance learning unit. So this is a, a, a sort of mock-up of, of what this uh, support model might look like. So this is an example. Uh, so this could be where the primary tail team is based within an IT department uh, and they have good links with an educational development department, but they might also have some individual learning technologists who they don't really know much about. Uh, and then they might have a, a, a strong local team within their medical school that again, they, they have a good connection to. Another way of looking at it might be you've got a, a primary tail team who are based in an educational development department. They have good links to IT and then there's a local team within their business school. And this is fairly similar to the model that we've got at City, at City where we have a, a digital learning unit within our business school who focus primarily on, on the fully online programs for the business school. And this is just another way of looking at it. You could be based in a, a combined service at library and IT, uh, again, with a couple of local learning technologists that you don't really have much to do with. Okay, so uh, if you haven't already opened up Poll Everywhere, then if you could go to polev.com slash Julie Vos. Um, I'm going to do a poll just to find out how well this sort of tell support structure uh, describes that of your own institution. So we're thinking about this primary tell team, so mainly a tell team 
but maybe who works in conjunction with other units and there might be some local tell support. Okay, so your options there are, does it describe it perfectly? Is it very similar? Is it fairly similar? Or is it not at all similar? So it's great to see some results coming in. Okay, so we've got quite a few results. We've got two say it describes it perfectly. The majority uh, say it's fairly similar. Uh, so what we're going to do in a minute is just look at um, your own uh, structures and share those. Um, and then we can have a, a chat about how, how similar it might be to the model. Okay. So for those where you did say it was different, uh, perhaps you could just write in what the differences are between the structures that I, I've proposed and, and that of your own institution. Okay, so some interesting comments coming in. So no local faculty teams at all. That's interesting, no local teams. There's only two of us. Yes, it's amazing how how the the size of tail teams vary across across the sector. There are some which are very small, and then there are some which you know we have over sort of fifty staff in. And some a lot of them are the ones that do more on the learning design side. OK, so thanks for that feedback. What we're going to look at next uh, is asking you to map out your own tail support structure. Uh, so you can do this on paper or um, you can do it electronically. Um, the idea is to, to pop it into Padlet. If you don't want to draw it, then feel free to just write it, write it down. Um, I've got an example here of, of cities, one that I've tried to draw out. So we're based uh, in the digital education team and I've actually split that into three different areas so we have a school liaison some people talked about having people who are sort of contacts in the central team that uh, work with the schools. so that's what we have there we have an operations team who do a lot of our support and training and core support for the central technologies and then we have a projects team who focus on some of our more larger scale more strategic projects like things like learning analytics digital accessibility and then we have links with uh, other areas so we have a link with IT because um, they provide all the, the uh, services that, that we 
we support. Uh, we have a link with our digital learning team in the business school. And then we've got a new STEM digital academy um, at City in our School of Maths, uh, Computer Science and Engineering. So we're working with them on some learning design stuff. Um, so the idea is, yeah, map it out, um, draw it on paper or just write it down into Padlet. Um, and I'll share the Padlet link in a minute. So that'll be the first five minutes. And then after that, what I'd like you to do is to there's a document in Padlet. I'd like you to have a look at it and again, try and map this out. Think about um, the relationships that you have with those other units. Now, if you've only got yourself, then uh, there's probably not much to think about. But yeah, think about um, how you might work with those other units uh, and what is the level of interaction you, you currently have with them? So do you see them a lot? Do you, is it more infrequent? And what influence do you have over them? So are you in the same sort of organizational structure? Um, do you have a, a lot of influence because you both report into the same line manager or, or do you have sort of very little influence over them? Um, so this is a really interesting way of thinking about the working relationships that you might have with those other teams and, and how you might look at strengthening them because you might identify well actually we don't interact with these people and we don't have any influence over them but actually if they're really important in in supporting tell what is it you need to do to try and increase either one of those so i'll share the padlet link in the chat and i'll give you about sort of 10 minutes to to look at that I have two laptops here, so just trying to share that across. So take your time, put some music on. I'm not going to play any music for you, and uh, neither Emma or I are going to sing. So, uh, yeah. If anything's not clear, then just uh, post something in the chat or feel free to, to ask.
that's not a problem, Angela. Don't worry if you don't get a chance to post it in the Padlet. The activity can be quite useful just for yourself to reflect on, you know, who actually supports TEL within your institution and, and how you interact with them. Very pleased to see a structure appear. Thank you, Queen's Belfast, <laughs> for reassuring me that someone is out there doing this. <laughs> OK, so you might want to start thinking about your interaction and influence grid if you haven't already started on that one. Yeah, I agree, Roger. I think bio and paper is the quickest one uh, rather than fiddling around in, in Word or PowerPoint. OK, just a couple more minutes on this and then we'll, we'll have a look at what we've got.
Okay, I'm just conscious of time. So thank you for sharing uh, the examples of your, your structures and, and feel free to continue adding to the, the Padlet while I'm, I'm talking. Um, it's good to see different examples here and uh, yeah, different levels of, of influence and interaction. I think we've got two where IT are quite a, a low, lowish level of interaction and also low level of influence, uh, which to me seems quite worrying given that you know, we rely on IT to provide a lot of that support. I just realised my camera's not on. Um, I mean, for for us, I think we've got the same issue in that you know our level of influence over IT is probably quite low, but actually our level of interaction is quite high because we do try and make sure we have regular meetings with them. So that's something you might want to look at in the influence interaction grid is how you might change that and where your key relationships are. And um, when I ran this activity before somebody, uh, what we did was we looked at um, where it is now and then where you want it to be. And somebody realized that actually there was a whole relationship that they sort of, they used to have a very good relationship with a particular team and that had dropped off. And actually that was something she was going to go back and, and see how she could change. Um, so we're talking about those working relationships. I've got a couple of questions for you to post your answers to in the chat. So how do you ensure good working relationships with other TEL support teams? Um, and do you have any formal or informal networks for TEL support staff? Um, so when I was at Imperial, we used to run um, a sort of monthly coffee morning for all the learning technologists. And that's because we didn't tend to meet on a regular basis. Otherwise, there'd be some of us who would meet through committee meetings. But it was a good way of getting together. And often people would share ideas and talk about what they're working on. So anything in the chat, what do you, how do you currently develop those relationships? So Tom, you've mentioned bottom up communities of practice. So at City, we used to have um, a different different groups like an educational multimedia group. And it was yeah, a different way of bringing people together on particular topics. Yeah, monthly forums for learning technologists. I think it's tricky when you, you know, it's all easier when you're all in the same team, potentially, depending on the size of the team. But when when you're quite distributed across the organisation, I think you do need those those networks to bring people together. Shared teams area, that's good. Good idea, yeah. So Natalie mentions a monthly coffee catch up. Yeah, that's what we had at Imperial Digital Champions meetings. Great, some interesting ideas through there. So I'll move on to the next bit. OK, so the second team was thinking about the location of TEL support. Um, so this is a location in your institutional structure, but it could also be your physical location within the organisation, although most of us are now, are now working from home for a lot of it. Um, so the literature um, suggests that the location of TEL support can really influence the perception of TEL within the institution. So specifically, whether there's a perceived bias towards pedagogy or towards technology and that can lead to issues of credibility for tell teams so often there's this desire not to be seen as the IT team or the VLE people um, so land uh, talks about um, many learning technologists find themselves located in organizational spaces that are not seen to have what he terms educational agency or to be academic and so there's this sort of discussion around sort of third space professionals we we're not ac academic, but we're not fully professional services. We we fit in the middle, um, and a lot of institutions used to have a sort of term for academic-related staff, um, but that seems to have disappeared a little bit in some. 
Uh, and then location within a department with the teaching and learning focus was felt to be um, a strength because it provides a greater emphasis on uh, pedagogy and it helps to distinguish you a little bit from IT support. But then other people felt that actually being in IT, it was easier to influence some of the technical developments that might be happening. Um, and then thinking about how you might develop your professionalization, your credibility through things like professionalization. So doing something like CMO or fellowship of the HEA uh, or even going on to do a PhD, I think that that can all help strengthen your credibility. But sometimes when you go to help with an issue, they still see you as the, the techie person uh, and it can take time to get staff to, to realize that you do know a bit about pedagogy as well. You almost have to sort of present your credentials when you go and talk to them. So what I'd like you to do now is respond to the polls. This is a poll everywhere again. Um, and just say where in the institution your TELL team is located. And if, if it's none of the ones I've listed, then please feel free to post it in the chat. OK, so it's where where is your TELL team located? So it's IT, teaching and learning, library. If you're a combined service, then I guess you could put other or just put uh, either IT or library. Uh, student services, uh, local support or, or other. So quite a few other people said other at the moment. Yeah, just pick the one that's closest to, to what yours is. I mean, teaching and learning might also be called educational development, for example. So we've got a few in local support, a few in IT. But the dominant is, is teaching and learning, it seems. OK, it looks like the numbers have stopped moving, so we'll close that one off. So dominant is in with a, a teaching and learning unit, which is great because it really does help with that, that credibility. So uh, a different Padlet this time. I want you to uh, look at the different areas. So think about the area that you're based in. Um, but also think about the other areas. Um, identify what you would think is a strength or a weakness or an opportunity or a threat, so, so a SWOT analysis of the specific locations. And before you post your comment, if you could put either strength or, or S just to indicate so that we know what, um, you, what your comment is about. So I'll just post that link in the chat for you. So we'll have five minutes on this one. So yeah, comment on the one that you're based in or, or maybe think about, you know, if you were to be based in an IT unit and you're in teaching and learning, what might be the strengths of being there? Uh, what might be the weaknesses of your current area?
So some really interesting responses coming through here. Thank you. So IT, there's definitely the, the worry about being seen as the, the techies or people who can fix the printer. But some strengths around having joined up thinking uh, with other aspects of IT, working with colleagues on technical solutions, uh, teaching and learning, some strengths around the sort of teaching and learning aspects being involved in development programs, HA fellowship. Uh, some weaknesses about being too strongly associated with pedagogy of theory instead of practical tech support. Some issues about library, but those in, in a library being too, too hidden away, no visibility. And for the local support, sort of lack of control over systems and deployment. Having to plug holes that the central team should have dealt with. <laughs> but some really strengths about being able to, it's those working relationships, isn't it? And understanding what they need locally. And that's what some central teams do try to do with sort of either school based staff or school facing staff. So where you have those named contacts within a, a central team who are the, the liaison between the school and the centre. And I think that that can help with the, those feelings of sort of disconnect between a local team and the centre. So hopefully you've had a chance to look at what some of the other people have, have picked and, and do feel free to keep adding to that. I've got another poll for you now. So thinking about some of the, the comments that people have made um, and thinking about your own uh, area, where in an ideal world would you like your tell team to be located? Would you pick any of these or, or would you pick some somewhere else? Uh, we've got a few results come in, so let's have a look. So that's quite a change from the very first question. Uh, so it looks like a lot of people would, would move out of IT and probably towards teaching and learning. Or, or your own team. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing I haven't added in is, you know, maybe the option of a standalone sort of digital education team. And I think at LSE, they used to be quite separate and then they were brought under IT. Yeah, I think there's the challenge of when you're under a, a teaching and learning unit or an IT unit, you reflect just that unit, whereas actually we're a bit of both and it's really tricky to sort of have your own identity out side of that wider umbrella. OK, uh, just conscious of time, so we'll just move on to the, the final bit. Uh, so this is around sort of TEL governance. Um, so the research identified that linking TEL into the main university committee structure was a real enabler for TEL developments, especially those where uh, policy changes were required because it led to greater visibility of TEL amongst senior management. Um, all the case study institutions reported having an institutional level committee which governs TEL, um, where TEL is represented by the head of TEL or the equivalent. Um, and in addition, where such a committee exists, TEL is typically linked into the university structures as part of a, a three level structure connecting TEL with the top most committee, which might be council or senate. So this is an example of this sort of three level structure. So you might have a lower level committee, um, which would be maybe a TEL or an education focus committee, then it links into a mid-level one this could be sort of information services or a teaching and learning committee education committee and then you would link up into something uh, and they're, they're all called something different but you might have an academic board or a senate for example 
And then in addition to this sort of formal committee structure, um, participants also reported having various user forums, project boards, virtual learning environment governance groups that would either sit alongside these or underneath this sort of primary governance structure. And they were to facilitate some of the more operational dis discussions. But this isn't necessarily representative across the, the sector. Now, the 2016 uh, USISA survey asked about governance, and in there, only half of the uh, institutions had an institutional uh, committee governing tell. Um, so in 2016, 20 said they didn't have any tell committees or working groups. And that reduced uh, to 11 in the 2018 survey. But obviously, the, the number of respondents uh, alters and different institutions respond uh, to the survey. Um, but also 70% of those who did say they had something, they, they said it was their teaching and learning committee that governs TEL, um, along with the presence of other sort of TEL related committees or working groups. So they might have learning spaces group or a electronic management of assessment group, for example. So another poll here. So how well does this sort of three level governance structure describe that in your own institution? So do you have a clear sort of governance structure for TEL? Uh, is it embedded into um, something just like a teaching and learning committee or do you have your own uh, TEL committee? So again, it's, does it describe it perfectly? Is it very similar, fairly similar, not at all? Or we don't have a committee governing TEL. So Rachel's made an interesting comment about the problem of the committee is that it's sometimes led by academics who don't really have the experience that a learning technologist would have. Yeah, I think you do need to have that representation of the learning technologists on these groups. That's that's key. So let's see what people have said. OK, so fairly similar, but actually quite a few of you don't have a, a committee governing tell. That's interesting. OK, I'm going to stop that one there. OK, so this is a, the final Padlet. So if you could just share the governance structure again, if you want to draw it and take a photo or, or just type it out. Um, and if you don't have one, maybe just uh, reflect on what you do do in terms of getting uh, new systems approved or policies approved. You know, who do you report into, basically? Uh, that would be good to know. And then do you think it's effective um, for enabling TEL within your institution? Is there something that you'd like to improve here for your structure? So I'll just put that link into the chat for you. So Caroline's noted that the, the rapid response to online teaching and learning due to COVID has raised the TEL profile. Yeah, definitely. It was the same for us at City. You know, suddenly I'm being invited to all these these meetings that normally I wouldn't necessarily have been invited to. So, it, you know, it's great. Uh, and I think that comes back to what we were talking about in terms of location. You know, often if you're in a, a bigger unit, it's the director of that unit or the head of that unit. And, um, you know, the, if you've got the director of IT attending, do they know exactly everything about um, digital education, likewise the director of a teaching and learning unit. So it's about how we get that representation for us as, as educational technologists, learning technologists, um, when you know we're having to rely on people maybe slightly up the hierarchy. Rachel makes a good point about the value of a committee if they have no power to influence actual actual practice. I mean, you could argue that most university committees probably don't influence actual practice, but that's probably another topic of this conversation. Simon says, after months of asking, they've got a digital technology and education working group about to be created. That's good. I think one of the debates uh, people have had in the past, and it's similar to when you have strategies, do you have a separate committee and strategy for, for TEL or digital education, or do you bundle it up into teaching and learning 
uh, you know but I think sometimes you, you get a little lost in teaching and learning because there's so many other aspects you just become a sort of a, a one one item on a long list whereas at least when you've got your own committee you can you know spend that time discussing these issues rather than getting five minutes because that's all they've got alongside all the the quality issues and program approval and all these other things that happen in, in the teaching and learning world Okay, there's an interesting uh, local perspective around sort of the approval from faculty operational committees but then if you require more having to go through central committees yes going through committees takes time doesn't it um, but i think some of the challenges we have in central teams is that things can be approved at a faculty level and therefore they can move a lot more quickly than we can centrally and that's where you get that disconnect between the central teams and the local teams and and some of that sort of frustration that local teams are able to sort of progress things when centrally you, you, you can't. And Pu Yin, you've got a great example there. You just uh, ask your boss for something. That sounds brilliant. No committees at all. OK, we're almost at time, but again, please feel free to continue adding to the Padlet. Um, so all of this uh, was obviously my PhD research and, and I wanted something practical uh, after that. So I developed what, what was called a frame, framework for action. And some of the activities we've done today are part of that framework. So what it does is it takes you through thinking about your tail support structure like we've done today. So mapping it out, uh, maybe thinking in an ideal world, you know, where it might be and then thinking about how effective that structure is currently for, for what you're trying to achieve in your institution. Then again, what we've done today is looking at your location within the institution and thinking about how you relate to the other teams that, that support tail. Then looking at how you identify and support those local needs. So especially if you're in a central team, what do you do uh, to understand local needs? Do you have school facing or school based staff or do you have good connections with local uh, learning technologists? Do, do they do a lot of the work? Do you have committees or working groups that you might use? So I think somebody mentioned about digital champions. So there's different ways that you can identify and support those local needs, but it's thinking about what you do and how effective that is. And then thinking about the flexibility of your team. So coming back to the beginning, I talked about how a lot of teams started off as just VLE support and then you're asked to adapt and adapt and adapt. So how easy is it for um, your team to adapt to some of these changes? And, and we've probably been all incredibly flexible over COVID, but thinking, you know, moving forward as more and more things move online, you know, how flexible is your team in, and how easy is it to get additional resource without having to go through the five or six committees that were mentioned to, to get pro projects or, or maybe staffing approved. And then as we've just done thinking about your TEL governance, you know, do you, do you need to have a committee for TEL? Is that a, a blocker at the moment, not having something where you can discuss these issues? Um, so the framework for change is available for online. So please download and have a look I know um, at least one person in the audience has, has had a go at that and found it useful um, but that's it from me uh, I hope it was useful I hope it, it gave you some pause for thought around how your your uh, tell teams are structured and and something you might be able to do moving forward in terms of changing it so the framework for action will give you a sort of change and action plan uh, as well that you can develop so that's it so yeah happy to take any questions uh, either via the chat or I don't know if you're allowed to open your microphone up. Um, hi, can I just say thank you so much, Julie. You've provided a lot of um, food for thought for this afternoon. I really enjoyed that session. Um, I haven't noticed any. Um, uh, I haven't noticed any questions, just comments in the chat. But um, but if anybody wants to, we've got a few minutes before we end. If anyone wants to put their hands up. Um, and you can unmute or you can ask a question. 
We'll give it a few moments. No, it doesn't look like there's any questions at the moment. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for taking part. What I'll do is I'll, I'll try and wrap this up into a, a blog post for all, and then I can share the, the Padlets that you all contributed to, if you're all happy for that. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to go back to the Padlets and add anything more. Um, I hope it's been useful. And, uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch with me if you do want to sort of have a chat about tell support structures. I, I, it's one of my favourite topics. So. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thanks, everyone.